We have a talk on push EBP. Please welcome Tom Stan, Stan excuse me, Sam Stag. There we go. Hi, my name is Tom Samstag. I'm a security engineer at Security Innovation in Seattle, who, by the way, is hiring in Seattle and Boston. I hack with the NIG9 crew. Uh, we're pretty active in contests and CTFs, and we're always looking for more dedicated people to, to join, up us, join up with us and help out with those contests. And that's enough with the introductions. What are we here to talk about? I wish I could say I'm here to show you some awesome O'Day, something that you've never seen before that will own any computer out there, but I'm not. Instead, I'm here to tell you about an idea. An idea that I had that I haven't been able to find described anywhere online, any other literature. So. I decided to present it here to a room full of smart people. And in the best case scenario, either someone will come up to me and say, yeah, that's been done. You can read more about it over here. Or someone will take it, run with it, develop it further. So a little bit of context. I was working with remote format string exploitation, the, the type of exploits where you have no binaries to, to analyze or reverse engineer. You have no post-crash forensics. And in my case, I was working on Linux. It, it would probably, what I'm going to show will probably extend to other Unix uh, operating systems. I was working in x86. It may extend to some other architectures. But I was knee deep in, in exploring this idea. And as a background and to ramp back up on the material, I was using the material by Paul Haas that he presented at DEF CON 18 in a talk titled Advanced Format String Attacks. And it's a pretty good rundown of the entire background of format string vulnerabilities. And it helped me not only to ramp up on what can be a pretty confusing type of vulnerability, but to help formalize the steps. And so I went at it systematically, dumped the stack values, easy enough. It's the first step you do whenever you find a format string vulnerability. Find the parameter offset to the format string. Again, pretty simple. Then you have to figure out where the format string stack, where the format string pointer is on the stack, where the actual location of that pointer is. And then, of course, you write your shell code and your exploit in the format string, and you win. It's that third step, the finding the address that I kept getting stuck. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized part of the reason why Paul Haas and his presentation had such an easy job at it was that his vulnerable code was a little bit simple, a little bit simpler than what I was looking at. And so I started to think about how else could this be done. So as a quick little recap, we have the classic diagram of what the stack looks like. In this case, this is just after finishing the, the setup of the printf function. So at the top of the stack, we have the EBP value that printf has pushed on. We have the return address from printf to the call code. We have the pointer to the format string, printf parameters, and then we have the local variables of the calling code, its EBP value, its return address, et cetera. And so the, when you look at this from the point of view of printf, you have your index parameters that you can print out starting at param1, param2, et cetera. But what you really want is the, the contents of that format string pointer and the location of it. And it would be so nice if you could say, give me that zeroth parameter. But you can't. And so what, my, what I worked on doing looked at the EBP values. Now, you, you have to remember that this old EBP zero, the value in that, that word on the stack is the address of old EBP one. 
Likewise, inside the, the position of oldbp one we have the address of oldbp 2 and likewise down the stack. So what we have mixed in in this dump of the stack that we've done is we have a data structure where if we could pick it out, this data structure has a linked list almost, a, a list of values, and this data structure depends not only on the contents of the stack, but the location of the stack. Because if we were to take this data structure and move it anywhere else in memory, those links would fall apart and it would no longer be a structure. So if we can find this structure in our dump of the stack, then we'd be able to know where the stack is. We'd be able to get that address. And at this, at this point, I was kind of convinced that this could work. And I thought it was pretty cool. But how do you do it? So that's where I'm going to get into the pseudocode. So after you get a dump of the stack, we're going to say we have n 32-bit n 32 bit words dumped from the stack. And we're just going to set up some nested for loops for indices into that stack dump. We're going to, the outer one's going to go from the beginning to the end. The inner one's going to go from the outer loop index to the end. Simple enough. So now we assume that these two indices of our nested loops are the indices into the stack that represent those two EBP values. So we pull out the values from whatever our stack dump is stored in. And then remember that old EBP1 contains the address of old EBP2. So that tells us the address of, assuming that we've found the correct EBP values, that gives us the address of EBP2, just by whatever we pulled out of the stack for EBP value 1. And once we have that, we can easily figure out the address of the first one. We know how far apart they are in memory. We know four byte words. And so it's simple enough to figure out the address of these two, assuming that they are EBP values. Once we've done that, we can start looking at it a little bit further. We can check to see if it's plausible. Now, since the EBP values in this chain are always going to be going down the stack, their values are always going to be increasing. So we're going to say this isn't a valid guess if the EBP value or the address of the second one is less than or equal to the address of the first one, or if their addresses are separate by more than some threshold. You figure a call stack should only be a certain size. If it's above some arbitrary threshold, you're probably looking at random data. And if we pass those tests, we're going to continue to assume that these are two valid EBP values. And after we do that, we can figure out the base address. We can figure out the address of the first object in that stack dump that we have. In the case of the stack that we looked at earlier, it would be the address of that first parameter. And that's simple enough to do just by taking the index of the EBP values and its offset. So now we have a situation where we may know the, the location of our stack dump. But we're still going to have a lot of false positives mainly because we only looked at two elements in that linked data structure. So how do we decrease our false positives? We look at more elements in that linked list. So we're going to unwind down the stack. Um, above the, before the, the while loop here, we just set it up. We're going to start looking at the index of the second EBP value that we picked out before. We're going to, we're going to fill our, our data structure in this case, frames, we're keeping a list of the indices to those EBP values with the first one. And we're just going to loop over that stack, keeping that list of the frame indices and the next address. And inside that while loop, we're going to, again, just do a, a couple sanity checks. The first one is different. We're going to say if the next address, if the pointer is null, then we've reached the end of this, this uh, data structure. So the EBP values make this link list, but at the very beginning, in all my testing, that address contains a null. So the first EBP value is going to be null. And if we find that, then we know we're done. We're going to look at the same tests that we did before, looking to make sure that the, address, the addresses that we're seeing are ascending and that they're, they're relatively close. And then the last test that we're doing 
is to see if the next address is aligned the same. If it's not aligned the same, it's again probably just arbitrary data. And at this point, we know that this, this next element is probably a valid element within this linked list that we found on the stack. And then we just prepare to loop back around and continue on. And now we close out the inner while loop. We push onto a collection of possibilities a set of the base address that we figured out before and a list of those frame indices. So, and then we finish our outer for loops. So at this point, what do we have? We have a list of possible base address and frame sets. We have a bunch of possible sets of these link lists that we found in our stack dump. One of them is correct, hopefully. And we most likely have a bunch of false positives. So the real question becomes, now that we've pruned it down to a smaller list of false positives, how do we figure out which one is most likely to be the actual stack frames that, that our program has? Well, in all of my testing, I've found that if you look at the possibility with the longest list of frames, then you're most likely looking at the actual uh, structure of frames on the stack. And that's pretty cool because it seems to work out. But how do we know for sure? Well, it turns out that we can actually verify this relatively easy in the case of format string vulnerabilities. So we already found this base address. We picked out the one that looks most likely. But if we look at the base address minus four, we have the pointer to the format string. And if we're talking about format string vulnerabilities, it's easy enough to read whatever values at that location and then read whatever value is at the location pointed to as a string. And it should be our format string. And at this point, we're pretty sure that we actually figured it out. And not only that, but we get a bonus. Because if you look at eight, bef eight bytes before the, the base address, we have the return address. And the, the really cool thing about finding the address, the return address here, is that this is the return address from printf. This, is, this means that if you overwrite this return address, you're going to return directly to your shell code from printf. You're not going to run any more application code, unlike if you were to return, uh, overwrite a return address later down the stack. One caveat there is that you may need to try base address minus 8, minus 12, minus 16, a few possibilities to, to deal with the different printf functions. Some of them have a few more parameters than, than others, but that's a little bit easier to, to brute force than brute forcing all of the addresses on the stack. So what just happened? We were able to derive the stack location and the frames on that stack from just the stack contents and get the format string pointer location. And as a bonus, we were able to get the return address location. I think that's pretty cool. So where do we go from here? You tell me. I just wanted to give you the idea. Run with it. My name's Tom Samsteg. That's my email address. All of these slides can be downloaded directly from that location. And I hope someone can develop this a little bit further. Any questions? Have you uh, found this to be true for other compilers, uh, say, like you're working with Visual Studio or something like that as well? Are you able to use this in the same for different compilers as well? Um, the question was, does this apply to different compilers? Um, and you mentioned Visual Studio. Uh, I haven't worked much lately with uh, Windows binaries, but I know they use a different calling uh, method. And in the most recent times I've looked at Windows binaries, they don't use the EBP values the same way. So it wouldn't apply to that. All of my testing was on Linux. Um, it, I don't see why it wouldn't apply to the other Unix architectures, though, or the other Unix OSs. 
Um, and I also haven't expanded to see how it would work on 64-bit. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.